Welcome to Esoteric Night. Today, we're diving into the Colburn Bible, the Colburn Manuscripts, and I am so excited to bring you this video. I've made a couple of videos in the past on the Colburn Bible, on some of the esoteric mysteries or the philosophy and wisdom within it, but today I went above and beyond. I put together a little presentation for you guys that starts with an introduction and background to the Colburn, goes into how Jesus is a central figure in the second half of the Colburn, and how so much of the sayings and his teachings, you know, in that part of the book have never been seen before. And then we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to crack right into the Colburn and go into some of the wisdom sayings of Jesus and some of his bio biographical info that, you know, really no one knows about. No one's talking about this, so I'm so excited to bring it to you guys. If you want to see another video on the Colburn, I have the next one planned on the Book of Wisdom and the Book of Lucius, the my two favorite books in the Colburn Bible. So make sure to subscribe and hit that bell notification to stay tuned for that. Without further ado, my friends, let's dive in to the Colburn Bible and how it relates to Jesus. So first off, the background of the Colburn. To me, the Colburn is the most profound and instructive of any of the ancient texts I've discovered. Philosophy, psychology, wisdom, cultural guidelines, prophecy, and esoteric mysteries are all woven together by past masters into a gem meant for our age. It is uncanny how accurate and relevant the teachings are to modern life. The Colburn, the interesting thing, my friends, is the Colburn, along with you know, other texts like the Nag Hammadi scriptures and the Dead Sea Scrolls, are relative, have recently come to light, like this vast treasure trove of ancient knowledge, ancient philosophy, ancient religion, has come to light in the past century, out of nowhere, right? And all of these sources are actually very close to, the, to when Jesus was alive, if not were written while he was alive. And the Colburn might be actually the best source for authentic teachings of Jesus and the life of Jesus that may exist. Yet no one is talking about it. If you look up Colburn Bible on, on YouTube, for instance, all you're going to see is like, you know, readings of the first four books or the creation myth. But the, this, the Colburn Bible is full of the most profound wisdom, esoteric mysteries, like non-dogmatic philosophy, and just like uncanny personal development, you know, wisdom for you. And no one's really talking about it, and no one is addressing the, the, you know, the elephant in the room is the fact that Jesus might have written the entire second half of this book, or it was directly inspired by him. We're going to get into that in a second. The Colburn is a collection of manuscripts from antiquity. The first six books are called the Egyptian text and were penned by the Egyptian academics and initiates following the Hebrew exodus around 1300 B.C., the last five books are the, the Celtic texts, which are pen, penned following the death of Jesus by Celtic priests and even Christ, Christ's disciples. And these texts, the Celtic te texts, they might have been inspired and even written while Jesus was alive. We're going to get into this. <clears throat> Hidden within the, the immense Tom. So the Colburn Bible, it's a thick book. And many people like get lost trying to, you know, go through it. There's a lot of parts about laws and stories and people you don't know about, but then all of a sudden you just stumble on wisdom. And that's really what I'm trying to do here is like condense it and point the way to, you know, how you can use this book. And I highly encourage you dig deeper in here. Um, so hidden within the immense tom, toms of myth and wisdom of many peoples, there's laws and documents of budding nations, and there's inspiring stories about the sons of fire and the great path of the true way. This is one of my favorite parts of the Colburn, which we'll dive into in the future. Perhaps most fascinating are the books of wisdom written by the illuminated sages, the twice-born ones, who shine forth with wisdom and God inspiration. My friends, a lot of the books in the Colburn were written by God-inspired ones, like figures similar to Christ, if not Christ himself. There are even direct writings of Jesus and his disciples that aren't found elsewhere. This is what I find most remarkable, is these are like authentic sources that you know, you literally can't find elsewhere. You don't hear this stuff anywhere else. And it's written like so directly for the modern tongue. If I edit this video, I'll give you a little taste right here. But 
to finish with our little, you know, introduction here. The Colburn and its origins are a deep mystery. Proving their authenticity and origin is not my fight. It's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to open it up and share the gems that most inspire me. And um, especially in this age without brotherhood, without moral principles and leadership, without God, you know, without spirituality, this book, The Colburn, presents a non-dogmatic philosophy for direct spiritual awakening and treading the great path of the true way. I really think a lot, I really think this book is meant for our times. If you're interested in the Colburn, a fellow seeker uh, emailed me a while back. Sean Kenny made a whole description and guide for reading the Colburn. All relevant links will be in the description below. Moving on to part two, Jesus. The Colburn contains a previously unseen bio biographical account of Jesus with many first person quotes. There are also further texts written or inspired by him that the world has never seen. Okay, there's a little taste of what we're going to get into. Here's, a, here's chapter 3 of the Britain book, and it's a biography of Jesus as well as sayings of Jesus. Um, just a little taste for you guys. Nobility demonstrates an ability to live and act according to the high principles. It is expressed in deeds, outlook, and bearing in the manner of life and relationship with others, that which ennobles a man is his recognition of something to love and strive for outside of himself. Nobility is the sub subordination of self to principles. Wow. Where have you heard a saying of Jesus like that about nobility? You know? And it and it's, comes from man's ability to love and strive for something outside of himself. For the love of family, for the love of brotherhood, for the love of God. Nobility is a subordination of oneself to principle. So this is a little taste of what we're going to be getting into here. Okay, so the, the Celtic books make up the second half of the Col Colbrin, and they are Origins, the Silver Bow, the Book of Lucius, the Book of Wisdom, and the Britain Book. There's something very significant about all of these. Okay, I'm going to read an intro from the Colbrin introducing these books, and then talk about them and how they relate to Jesus. Gems right here. Inspired by the scope of the Egyptian texts. So the Egyptian, my friends, history lesson real quick. Around, you know, like 400 BC until, you know, right through the Roman era, the Mediterranean world was very connected, was very mobile, right? The Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, like all over the coast of the Mediterranean, people were sharing ideas, people were traveling, people were trading all the way out of the gates of Heracles, up the coast of Europe, all the way to Britain, to, you know, a lot of mines were up there even, where the Phoenicians would get their tin and their copper. My friends, the world was more connected than we think, and people moved a lot more in the past than we have been, you know, led to believe. So these Egyptian texts were brought up to the Celts, up to the Brits, up to the Anglo-Saxons, you know, um, the, the Egyptian bronze book anyway, which was written around the time of Exodus, was brought up there and shared amongst, you know, the, the Europeans of the north. And the Druids were inspired by this. So let's talk about the Celtic texts. Inspired by the scope of the Egyptian text, the Celts wrote their own historical and philosophical anthology or collection of books in a similar manner, but in their own language. Viewed as a religious work by many, the Celtic texts were a time, offer a timeless insight into Druid folklore, mysticism, and philosophy. According to some historians, the Kohl book, or you know, the Celtic books, was also inspired in part by a visit by Jesus Christ to Britain. At the time, Jesus was either in his late teens or middle twenties and traveled via high-speed Phoenician trading ship to Britain with his great uncle Joseph of Ar 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 Arimanthia, who undertook the journey to inspect a tin mine he owned. So, my friends, if you just do a quick search for the lost years of Jesus, you're going to notice that there's 17 years missing in the chronicle in the conical gospels of Christ, right? And these 17 years missing, if you do, you know, um, if you study, you know, that time period and also look into the history and, you know, comparative religion, 
there's so much evidence that Jesus visited the Britons. He visited the Egyptians. He visited the yogis. He learned from all these schools of wisdom, just as Pythagoras did before him and Heraclitus did before him. My friends, there was a transmission of spiritual and philosophical knowledge in many schools and sects by gurus, by hierophants, by druids, by masters of initiation all over the Mediterranean world at that time. So, and there's evidence that he, that he visited uh, Britain. <laughs> These historians further maintain that Jesus studied the Egyptian texts in Britain. So he studied the Egyptian bronze book in Britain. The book, the, and this is because the Celtic texts penned following his, his possible visit contain a never before published, published biography of Jesus. So these Celtic books, which we're about to go into, contained never before biography of Jesus and sayings of Jesus. Given the detail and highly revealing nature of this biography, the case can be made that the, bio, that the, biography, the, the biographer personally met Jesus or interviewed someone who had. Additional corroboration comes from the reliable historical accounts that indicate Joseph of Arimathea founded the Glastonbury Abbey in or about 36 CE. So Joseph founded an abbey in 36 CE and that it eventually became the repository for these texts during the first millennium. Wow. So, wow. So Joseph went to Britain. That's, that's historical fact, right? And he brought texts with him, okay? And also he was the uncle of, you know, Jesus and Jesus may have traveled with him. There is a debate whether or not Jesus was directly responsible for the... So getting back to how Jesus relates to these final four books of the Celtic coal book, the Silver Bow, the Book of Lucius, the Book of Wisdom, and the Britain book. There is debate whether or not Jesus was directly responsible for the Book of the Silver Bow, the Book of Lucius, and the Book of Wisdom. And honestly, these are some of my favorite books in the entire Colburn. They may have been directly dictated by him under different names, or else they were certainly inspired by him and his travels through Britain. <clears throat> Regarding the different names, okay. First off, Joseph of Arimathea was purposely trying to escape the Romans and the Jewish authorities by going to Britain, even changing his own name. Also, in these books, we see that Jesus... Um, was safeguarding the more ancient sacred writings. And so perhaps separating his own teachings under two names was an added precaution to separate some of the more exoteric from the more esoteric stuff. Um, and it's no surprise that the books written by Jesus could be penned under different names because both Elidor and Lucius never referred to themselves by name. And also they carry a very similar style. Jesus may be Elidor and Lucius, or he may not. Either way, the texts of Jesus and these others glow with wisdom and revelations. The book of Lucius is one of my favorites, along with the book of wisdom, also attributed to Jesus, and the sons of fire. That was before Jesus' time. I think the sons of fire inspired Jesus. And in my understanding, the sons of fire transmitted the knowledge of the twice-born ceremony and the ancient esoteric wisdom that allowed Jesus to become the perfected initiate the world knows him to be, right? So he may or may not have written those books, but if he didn't write them, they were directly inspired by, by him because the Celtic priests who wrote those books definitely knew him and were definitely inspired by his teachings and the Egyptian teachings that taught Jesus, right? It's all so interconnected. We can't just look at it in isolated lenses, you know? The final Celtic book, the Britain book, right, which we're going to read from, contains two biographical chapters about the life and sayings of Jesus. For any non-believers at this point, remember, these texts were kept since ancient times in an abbey in Britain, right? And to contain the life and sayings of Jesus and being historically accurate, even matching some of the lost gospels of Thomas and other gospels that weren't even found until the 1945s, right? It's, it's really hard to disbelieve that, you know, the biographer, whoever captured these sayings, definitely knew Jesus or was directly related to Joseph. I personally hear a consistent voice through most of the Celtic book, right? 
through Lucius, Elidor, and Jesus. And to me, it makes sense that, the, that most of the Celtic book would be inspired or instructed by Jesus himself instead of tangential philosophies. Looking at the whole, the Celtic book appears to be re- revolving around the teachings the church wouldn't have allowed. This is really key, okay? The Celtic book appears to be revolving around the teachings the church wouldn't have allowed. At many points in the book of Lucius, in the book of Wisdom, even in the sayings of Jesus, the the path to God is revealed through gnosis, through spiritual attainment, through inner development. Jesus is presented as a as a man, not as a god, right? There's some massive discrepancies here, and women, Mary Magdalene, like are included in his disciples, right? So like if you really think about it, 99% of the uh, of the gospels and works related to Jesus aren't in the canonical Bible. The Bible that we know was written in Rome at, at the Nicene Conference, right? And there's so much left out. So these Celtic books appear to be revolving around the teachings the church wouldn't have allowed, either by Jesus's own design, knowing that his teachings may one day be corrupted, or by the design of later priests, the Celtics who organized and wrote and refined these texts. His most essential teachings may have been preserved. This is amazing, my friends, because like we look at, you know, the gospels in the Bible, they've been edited so many times and nitpicked for what they have to say. Um, and also so much of the direct knowledge and teachings of Jesus have, have been lost because those gospels have been written hundreds of years after his life, right? It was all transmitted through spoken word, disciple to disciple or person to person. But a thing about the, the bronze book and the Celtic book is it was the book he studied and it was potentially the book he wrote. Think about that. Like it might be the direct dictation of Jesus, just like we find in the Gospel of Thomas, one of the most close sources to Jesus. And the Gospel of Thomas is also highly, uh, you know, like related and almost reflected in the Colburn. So his, att- his essential teachings may have been preserved. If these speculations are accurate, the Colburn goes from profound, you know, from a profound book of wisdom to literally the Holy Grail of spiritual treasure. And in fact, it may be the Holy Grail that was said to be delivered to Britain. The Holy Grail, a series of documents were said to be delivered to to Britain that were the Holy Grail or related to the Holy Grail shortly after Jesus' death. Maybe this was it. Let's check it out. So a lot more could be said, my friends. I want to read from the book of Lucius. I want to read from the book of Wisdom. Definitely go check out my other videos on the Colburn. Just search Reality Files, Colburn Bible. But today, we're just going to read from the biography of Jesus and some of my favorite life and sayings. And my friends, we're going to hit on a quote of prophecy that literally gives me the shivers. So stay tuned for that. Let's do this thing. So this is chapter 3 of the Britain book, BRT 343. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like, a, is like a woman carrying a jar of good wine. Being careless, she puts the jar down heavily and crashes it. And when she resumes her way, the wine spills out behind her on the road. But she b- blithely continues on her way, unaware of the spillage. When she enters the house, the master takes the wine jar and finds it empty. The disciples asked, what could this mean? And Jesus replied, when you possess the good things of the kingdom of heaven, do not let them slip away. When you possess the good things of the kingdom of heaven, do not let them slip away. Ooh, I like that. You know, it's a lot different from the Eckhart Tolle and the modern teachers of, you know, spiritual epiphany. No, spiritual mastery is something that's gained and possessed and maintained and defended by a warrior, right? The kingdom of heaven is neither here nor there and contains all good things. It is in the hearts of men and exists where God reigns. When the lion lies down with the lamb and peace reigns over all, there shall be found the kingdom of heaven. Yet truly, heaven and the kingdom of heaven are not the same. These things were said in the forecourt of the temple. That's an interesting mystery. Heaven and the kingdom of heaven are not the same. Hmm. Jesus took the disciples who were with him to the court of the Hebrews, which was an inner place 
and a warden. A priest named Levi stopped them, saying to Jesus, Are you an ignorant man? Do you know it is forbidden to walk here in the presence of holy things without first purifying yourself? Blah, blah, blah. That's kind of the story of how uh, Jesus broke some of the rabbinical or uh, traditional Jewish laws. And he says, My disciples and I have, have little need for the outer forms of ritual cleanliness, being clean within, for we have washed in the living waters of the Spirit. Wow. He was baptized in the Spirit, and that's what he preached to my friends, not just baptism once in water. Um, okay, we're going to read one more thing here and before we get more towards the prophecy parts. Live your lives in the world of men who journey through a strange land, marveling at its wonders, tasting its pleasures, but ever on guard against danger. For undue love of the world is a doorway to evil. There are those who, who derive pleasure in being what they are not, but as their hair turns gray, they suffer, they suffer sorrow and frustration. Be ever true to yourselves and to your natures. My friends, this is a really pertinent quote because it echoes a lot of what is said in the, in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the non commodity scriptures, as well as Jesus' sayings here that are not found in the Bible. He did not believe in sin as a thing unto itself. Sin to Jesus was over the, I guess, came from the over-identification with the material world and forgetting of your true divine origins. When you, you know, basically uh, commit adultery or, you know, uh, forget of your, your spiritual nature or do not know your spiritual nature, right? You start to derive pleasure in being what you are not. And this is what creates all pain, sickness, and even death. And to Jesus, the, the immortality, the everlasting kingdom was found in coming into true identification with the deep spiritual self, the eternal, you know, true nature within you. And separating, you know, the lead from the gold per se, separating your earthly self from the the divine self, the mortal the mortal shell from the divine, and in that in, in that identification, he said that much healing, miracles, you know, and uh, immortality is basically gained. But there's, I'm sure he's talking about immortality of the spirit, but also you know, like the he- healing miracles, all these things. Does that come from simple and utter conviction in who you are, in the knowledge of God? which is the knowledge of self and the embodiment of self, which is basically gnosis or direct spiritual knowledge. Interesting thoughts. Moving on to 351 here. I'm just nitpicking here, just trying to inspire y'all to read it yourselves. Um, Jesus was not a sorrowful man, for greatness cannot be downcast. Always he brought strength to the disheartened and was not influenced by the despondency of others. When Peter was dismayed and shut his sorrow within, Jesus said, If, my friend, you will not admit me into the antechamber of his sorrows, how can I ever sit in the reception room of his affections? Wow. Jesus set his face against all forms of melancholy. He said, The man who cannot rise above the burden of his sorrows or the trials of the day shall not know the kingdom of heaven, nor can he know the love which is the cornerstone of life. <clears throat> this is really... Um, important to me and relevant to the spiritual path in general, this idea of self-overcoming, right? So much of spirituality today is very soft. It's very dogmatically soft and religion is dogmatically tense. Jesus set his face against all forms of melancholy. The man who cannot rise above the burdens of his sorrows or the trials of the day shall not know the kingdom of heaven. My friends, the trials, the struggle, the strife here on earth it is a great boon to you, to the man who can bear it well, right? Like we, you know, suffering, toil, burdens, it's a lot of man. But it's really a t- the test of your spirit. How you bear your burdens, how you bear your struggle and suffering determines, you know, whether you cripple your spirit or you grow your spirit. And isn't the whole purpose of the body in this earthly life, you know, especially to a man like Jesus, the whole purpose of this Mortality is to serve and elevate and evolve the spiritual self within. 
So he who cannot arise above the burdens of his sorrows or the trials of the day shall not know the kingdom of heaven. This is the prophecy now. There will be an end to the beginning, and men will know this by the spirit of the times. Men will no longer be as brothers, nor will they be manly. Huh. We, don't, we definitely don't see that in our world, huh? Men will no longer be as brothers, nor will they be manly. Man, this is the plight of modern men. Women will be as men, and men as women. Adultery will not be condemned, nor will fornication. Therefore, therefore, these will flourish. Men will not honor their homelands, and there will be no discrimination among them, nor will they maintain the purity of their races. Fathers will not be honored, nor mothers respected, and children will be raised to be wayward. Perversions will be encouraged, and criminals will mock the law. <sighs> there will be an incest and rape, and it will be unsafe to walk abroad. Floods, famines, droughts, and earthquakes will cause death and destruction. Strange sickness will smite the people, and there will be a denial of God. Babes will be slain in the womb. Wow. Men will lust after the wives of other men. Marriage shall lose its meaning. Women will go to the marriage table unchaste and with deceit in their hearts. Their husbands, creatures of pity, will hear the mocking voices of laughing men. Priests will defile the, their altars with their impurity, and the rulers will be held in little repute. It is not God who marks the end of days, but men who, li but men who lives, lives as though setting a pitfall for himself. <clears throat> Jesus saw a man ill-treating a horse, and he rebuked him for his cruelty to a dumb animal. The man became angry and said, This is my beast. Jesus said, You are wrong. It is God's creature, and I... As a servant, am here to protect it. For no man can wholly own a living creature except to be in the name of the great God of life. Wow. Just a recap of that prophecy, my friends. That is so powerful. Men will no longer be as brothers. If you're a man out there, just raise your hand, drop a comment, hit a like. If you feel the pain of lacking brotherhood, lacking comrades, united in culture and united in purpose, you know, like not just getting together to talk or drink beers once a week, but like living, breathing, sweating, uh, crying, you know, celebrating together, like being together as brothers as we are meant to be, like men are, are, are meant to be in brotherhoods. And nor will they be manly. Like I work with clients and so many of my clients are you know, in myself in the past, and I see so many of my old friends, like, just constantly struggling with these emasculated addictions to porn, to, uh, to just distractions, to, to weakness, to effeminacy, you know, and it's good to know you're in a feminine, but also, like, if you're a man, you need to be able to embody your masculine, you must need, know that the, the, the masculine core, you know, and women will be as men and men as women. I mean, we see this, the lack of polarity in all of the world. And this creates huge problems in relationships, you know, because we don't have polarity anymore. We don't have that sexual tension. We don't have the, you know, and like, yeah, getting out of gender roles in some ways is a good thing. But also the, the traditional roles were there as a guideline, you know, a guideline to helping you cultivate that, that, deep feminine nature and deep masculine nature within you. Now, I'm not saying women can be masculine and men can be feminine. And if that's your nature, beautiful, cultivate that. But if not, we need to learn how to fully embody and come into the truth of our nature, right? Adultery will not be condemned, nor will fornication. Therefore, those will flourish. I mean, the age of promiscuity, like how many thirst traps do you see on Instagram and TikTok? Porn addiction is rampant utterly rampant, OnlyFans and all of this shit, like the, the mainstream media just like promotes this, this insane promiscuity. You go to the gym and women are literally wearing paint on pants. Like, my God. <laughs> he was right on that note. Men will no longer honor their home, ho homelands and there will be no discrimination among them. How many European men in this room know their ancestry, know where they're from, right? Know the traditions of their homeland. Almost none. 
it's taken extensive research for me to find like the, the threads, you know, going back well before, you know, a thousand, two thousand years back to the Scythians, you know, man, it's hard. No one knows about this. No one knows about our past and who we were and the stories we told. And those were so important. And nor will they maintain the purity of their races. I'm not going to speak anything on this, but, you know, it's an, it's an interesting thought to have. Fathers will not be honored, nor mothers respected, and children will be raised to be wayward. Facts. Perversion will be encouraged and criminals will mock the law. Hashtag. Uh, politicians. Government figures. There will be incest and rape and it will be unsafe to walk abroad. Floods, famines, droughts, and earthquakes will cause death. Strange sickness will smite the people, and there will be a denial of God. Babes will be slain in the womb. Men will lust after the wives of others, blah, blah, blah. Priests will defile their altars with impurity, and the rulers will be held in little repute. I, don't, I couldn't imagine having less respect for, for rulers. We could pick any common man off the streets, and he'd be a better ruler than we have now. And this fucking, oh my God. Anyways, my friends. That is the sayings, some of the sayings of Jesus. So much more could be do dove in here. Um, the next video I want to make is on the fall of man, on redemption, on the sayings of, of Lu Lucius, and spiritual rebirth, spiritual vision, the God-man, some of the deep esoteric mysteries. If you want to see that, definitely drop a comment and let me know. Let me know what you thought about this video. Share it with someone you think will impact. Share it on a Facebook group. Help get the word out there. Help spread the love. Help spread the message. My friends, that's the best thing you could do to support this channel. I put a lot of time and effort into creating this video and just hitting that like button and maybe, you know, giving it a share, giving it a comment is super helpful. Thanks for being here, my friends. All relevant links are down in the description. I will see you at the next video, at the next Esoteric Night. Peace.